In this session, uh, we're going to be discussing the big picture uh, on about the biggest scale possible. So the topic is the future of work. And to discuss that with me is Thomas Malone, who is Professor of Management at MIT Sloan School of Management. Thank you. And the author of a book on the future of, of work, um, called The Future of Work. Um, Tom, I, I asked you in advance, because this is such a huge topic, to pick three themes that you're particularly um, excited or interested in at the moment, and we'll focus in on those. So what's your first big? So my first theme is, after having just sat through most of the last panel in this room, where there was a lot of talk about freelancers, which I've talked about for many years and I think is a very important part of the future of work. But my first theme is to say, let's not just think about freelancers, let's think about volunteers. Not just people who get paid for working on our work, but people who work on our work without even getting paid. I think there is a huge and not yet widely appreciated opportunity for this. If you look at examples like Wikipedia, perhaps the best example of this, thousands of people all over the world have created the, the world's largest and an amazingly high quality intellectual encyclopedia, intellectual product, which in this case is an encyclopedia, with almost no centralized control, and by the way, without even being paid. I think that's a pretty amazing example, and it's actually not unique. Think of YouTube, where most of the work is done by volunteers. People are not paid to put their videos there, but there's a huge amount of interesting stuff there. Uh, think about Facebook, where the vast amount of the content is created by volunteers, doing it for their own reasons that are not money. So those, I think, are just a few examples of something that we're going to see more and more of. And, what do you, and when you say volunteers, I mean, I guess a large part of that is going to be the customer themselves and a lot of retail products where they're going to be involved in designing a product that's more uh, yeah. to their taste. I mean, what, what, but from a point of view of management, what, where does that, you know, where, where, where's the big opportunity to take okay. advantage of the volunteering? So, so I think the, from the point of view of management, one advantage is that you can sometimes get work for less money if you can find a way of enticing people to do it as volunteers. Um, I think the, the deeper question is, how do you motivate people to do the things you want them to do? And actually, at this level, it applies not just to volunteers out there in the crowd. It applies, in some ways, to your own employees. So in a paper we wrote recently called The Collective Intelligence Genome, we talked about three main motivations for people to do things. There's, of course, nothing completely new about this, but we think it's a useful checklist. The three reasons why people do things often boil down to money, love, or glory. So you do things for some combination of those things. Money is the one we know so well we spend a lot of time thinking about. We don't spend as much time thinking about love and glory. So love means things like, I do it because I just plain enjoy the work. A lot of the people who contribute to Wikipedia, for instance, just enjoy editing encyclopedia articles. I was at a Wikipedia meeting a few years ago, and it turns out a lot of the people who are heavy contributors to Wikipedia are people who, when they were kids, like I did, used to read encyclopedias for fun. So it's fun in some ways to do that. Uh, another reason people do things for love is because they like the cause that they are contributing to. Again, Wikipedia is an example of that. Uh, a lot of people there, I think, really like the idea of creating the world's biggest encyclopedia that's available to anyone in the world for free. Uh, people who work on the Linux open source operating system, at least in the early days of that project, were often motivated by doing something that was against the evil empire from Redmond, Washington. So whether you agree with the cause or not, it was an important motivation for the people there. And another form of love is that you just enjoy socializing with the other people you're working with. Again, I think one motivation for a lot of Wikipedia contributors is the opportunity to socialize with the other Wikipedia contributors. So I think that's love. And then finally, glory. 
is recognition, fame, honor, um, a lot of things that you can intentionally uh, encourage if you wish to. Anytime you have a website that has leaderboards of people with high scores, in fact, a lot of the stuff we heard about in, gamification, in the gamification talk this morning are examples of ways of getting glory to people who do things that you would like them to do. So if we just develop the point about love a little bit more, I mean, the, the cause movement has, has obviously you know, become a sort of a very cent you know, sort of conventional way of, of thinking. Companies all want to have a mission that supposedly makes them lovable and a cause, the more causes they can associate <laughs> with. But I mean, what, what in practice do you have to do to get people to really be willing to volunteer and, and, and do stuff for nothing, which is after all the goal of all this? Well, I don't think there's a, a simple, easy answer. I mean, it depends on the work you want to do and how you can figure out a way of, of making that be appealing to people. Um, in the case of Wikipedia, I think to the surprise of Jimmy Wales and most of the people involved there, it turned out a lot of people wanted to do this for fun, for free, in a way they hadn't thought of. An interesting point there, though, by the way, is um, if they had had to go through several layers of editing to get their work published, uh, it wouldn't have been nearly as much fun for people. So the, the ability to edit and have that edit be instantly visible to the world was an important part of what made that fun enough. And I think they also have a sustainability issue in the sense that it's great fun to write the first entry on, I don't know, Barack Obama, but it's not much fun editing the 100th version of yeah. it. In my opinion about Wikipedia, by the way, they missed a good opportunity to expand their scope beyond traditional encyclopedia articles. If they had said, now that we've pretty much got encyclopedia topics covered, now let's do a directory of all the humans on the planet or all the buildings on the planet or whatever, then there would have been a lot more interesting, fun things to do. So second big idea. Let me finish the, let me give okay. you the, the bottom line on the first one, if you don't mind. So here's my takeaway point on the first big idea. That is, traditionally, we think of marketing as something you do to convince people to buy your product. When a lot of the workers in your community are essentially volunteers, if you think of Wikipedia or you think of Threadless or Linux or lots of other uh, organizations like that, I think we need to apply many of the same disciplines we use in marketing to our own workers. We need to try to understand what motivates them, how to engage them, how to keep them engaged, all the things you would typically think about for a customer. I think increasingly we need to think about for our workers. So that's right. the, the, the first idea. The second idea is I think we need to move from traditional hierarchical organization charts to also thinking about decentralized design patterns. Again, in the article on the collective intelligence genome, we talked about some of these. And in fact, the examples I've already mentioned, like Wikipedia and Linux and so forth, are examples of how often in the future, I think, the way we need to think about organizing work is not simply mapped in an org chart. It has to do with some other kind of pattern in the ways people work together. So here's an example of a design pattern, what we call a collection. That is, a bunch of things contributed by different people working independently. So Wikipedia would be an example of that with different articles done mostly independently. YouTube would be an example of that with different videos contributed by different people independently. If you can organize what you want to have done in that form, then you may not need much hierarchy to get it done. People in the crowd work on the thing they want to do. They contribute it to the collection, and it's available to anyone who wants it. If nobody wants it, that's fine. Nobody cares. If a lot of people want it, that's wonderful. So that's an example of a collection. A particular kind of collection that we think is very interesting is what we call a contest. In fact, Innocentive is an example of a contest or the contest design pattern, where you have a collection, a lot of people independently creating things. In the case of Innocentive, the things they're creating are solutions to people's problems. But in the case of a contest, you don't just have the the collection available for everyone to look at all of, you really only want one or a few of those things 
So you have some way of selecting winners in the collection. The third example of a, of a design pattern would be what we call a collaboration. So the Linux operating system would be, or the community that created the Linux operating system would be an example of this, where a bunch of people are working on a bunch of different parts, but those parts are not independent of each other as they would be in a collection, they're interdependent. The different modules in a software system like Linux depend on each other, and so you have to worry in a, in a collaboration about managing those interdependencies in various kinds of either centralized or decentralized ways. So prediction markets, voting markets, social networks, those are all other examples of design patterns. But I think what we need to increasingly do is think about this broader palette of ways of organizing things. Different design patterns can be combined and recombined in different ways just like different genes can be combined and recombined in different ways to accomplish the goals we need to accomplish. So what does that mean for traditional companies? So it means they need to think outside the box of the traditional hierarchy. They need to say, what's our goal here? Is this something we could better achieve by creating a website where anybody can contribute things? Uh, is this something we could better achieve by having lots of people vote instead of having just the senior managers make the decision. Uh, somebody gave an example this morning about Whole Foods letting the employees vote on the medical plan, the health care plan they wanted every couple of years. Um, why not? There's no reason why the senior management has to make that decision. If they identify a set of alternatives that are all roughly equally acceptable from management point of view, why not let the employees vote to make that decision? So. I think that's the, the basic idea is think about more possibilities. Open your mind to this broader palette of design patterns that aren't all an example of the centralized mindset. OK. You want um, the third big idea? Yes. <laughs> OK. So the third big idea is that I think we need to move from just thinking about organizational productivity to thinking about organizational intelligence. How can we organize people so they're not just productive, but so they are what you might want to call intelligent, so that they're better at adapting to changing situations, better at sensing and responding to what's going on, better at innovative, innovatively doing new kinds of things. So, I think we still sometimes get stuck in the old productivity mindset, trying to think about how to be more efficient. And what we really need increasingly to be doing in our knowledge-based economy is try to think about how our organizations can be more intelligent. So I think there's a lot that could be said about that. The, the phrase we like to use is collective intelligence. We need organizations that are more collectively intelligent. I think there are more and more examples of those. And the kind of um, uh, slogan we use, the, the core research question we address in our Center for Collective Intelligence at MIT is how can people and computers be connected so that collectively they act more intelligently than any person, group, or computer? has ever done before? So that's the, the final question for that topic. Great. Well, I mean, I think those are three pretty big <laughs> themes. Anyone, you think so? Let's just, we, let's you think just, we should have done more in 12 minutes? You know. <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we've got some reactions or, or questions from, from the audience to chat. Uh, around here. Facebook. Facebook and YouTube and Wikipedia are all something very like a traditional media company in terms of the types of contributions they get. Are there examples that are less like a media company that you can give where that sort of volunteer contribution is creating a valuable product? Uh, another example I mentioned is Linux, the community that developed the Linux open source operating system. So that's um, uh, a software development company, a software company. I mean, the company that came, I came to mind as I heard you speak was a company called Quirky, which is uh, based in Manhattan on the the other side, which is, uh, has a whole community-based product design system where inventors who have a product they want designed post the idea, the community votes each week to 
take three of those ideas through to the next stage of development. Then they have a professional in-house development team that tries to take the idea and, and develop it, and all the time they're feeding it out to the community to make choices between colors, names, um, shapes and sizes, all those yeah. sorts of things, who are all getting rewarded by points, and ultimately if the product goes to market, they get they get some right. money, so, a share of the money. It's, I mean, it's a perfect example. It's a great example. I use that sometimes, too. You can yeah. think of Quirky as the new age version of Procter & Gamble. Mm -hmm. So they've kind of looked to the crowd to do their product innovation. Another uh, reaction from anyone? Yep. Have you got a microphone? Oh, yeah. Juan Gavarron, uh, Gavarron Foundation. I would like to ask you on all these um, ideas that you uh, tell us, where we are in terms of uh, how close we are on, on the US versus Europe versus Asia. Thank you. A good question. Um, I think we're, these things will happen everywhere. I think they're happening faster in some places than others. I think they're happening faster in places where creativity and innovation is most important. So in um, kind of uh, high-tech industries, in knowledge-based functions. Uh, and I think they're happening more in the US than in some parts of the world. Um, I think that uh, there are examples of this in in other regions like Europe and Asia. I just heard last night about a, a company in India where uh, there's a vast number of people under 25 doing some amazing things with social networks. So I think, I think the, the US may be kind of on average ahead of other regions, but I think there are a lot of pretty interesting things happening in other places. There may be some I don't know about that are even ahead of what's happening in this country. Linda. About Europe, speaking as a European, um, yeah. uh, right now, I mean, over the last five years, uh, one of the German regions, only a region of Germany, not even Germany, has invested <coughs> a billion pounds, a billion euros, into building open innovation. And that's been used primarily within BMW and Mercedes. So I think particularly it, that, that cluster, that knowledge-based base cluster in Bavaria mm -hmm. is a huge center, as you no, because they're very linked into MIT, is, is a huge center of open innovation now. Yeah. I think, actually, one thing we're likely to see is the answer to this question becoming less strictly regional. That'll, that is, there'll be some individuals, some specific companies, some small regions that are doing amazing things all over the world, but other people next door to them may not be. So it won't be just geography. It's more about the individual person and organization. I mean, on the, on the question of the intelligent company, I mean, I, I suppose one question that strikes me is that the, 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 the amount of data that's going to be produced and, you know, big data is going to be the theme over the next few years. I mean, the ability of a hierarchy to monitor uh, and control the performance of every individual uh, working for it is going to be greatly enhanced. And in a sense, you can imagine uh, less autonomy, less personal intelligence, less freedom to, to, to take decisions because you're being monitored the whole time. How, how are companies, you know, when, when you look at this rise of big data, how, how, what, what are the choices, what are the, which force is going to, 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 to emerge on yeah. top? Is it going to be the, the intelligence or is it going to be the control? Yeah. So good question. In fact, uh, that's one of the key questions I addressed in the book, The Future of Work. Yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right that cheap communication, and I think that's the underlying driver, not just big data. Mm -hmm. I think that cheap communication allows you to centralize control more, just as it allows you to decentralize control. And I think in cases where the benefits of centralization are important, like in certain kinds of semiconductor manufacturing, economies of scale are the critical, often the critical business factor in business success. So in those cases, I think cheap communication may lead us to centralize more, to take advantage of those economies of scale. But the key point is that in our increasingly knowledge-based and innovation-driven economy, 
the critical factors in business success will be things like creativity, innovation, flexibility, and motivation. And those are things that you usually get more of when more people have more power to make more decisions for themselves. So in precisely those parts of the economy where those things are important, and I think that's going to be more and more parts of the economy, that's where we should see cheap communication leading to more decentralization instead of more centralization. Well, we could probably have a whole day's conference on each of those themes, but unfortunately <laughs> we only had 20 minutes, and that 20 minutes is now up. So, Tom, I'd like to thank you very much for stimulating us and look forward to more conversations about these topics going forward. Um, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. And